Hello and welcome. The webinar is now beginning and we will start with a word from David Robinson and Sébastien Dubois. Bonjour et bienvenue. C'est maintenant le début du webinar. Commençons par le mot de David Robinson et Sébastien Dubois. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, my name is Dave Robinson. I'm the interim uh, president and CEO of Destination Canada. And uh, joining me in welcoming you here today is Sebastian Dubois, who's Destination Canada's Executive Director of Industry Partnerships. Merci, David. C'était David Robinson, Président et Directeur Général par Intérim à Destination Canada. Bonjour et bienvenue à tous, chers amis et collègues de l'industrie touristique. Pour ceux qui ne me connaissent pas, mon nom est Sébastien Dubois et je suis directeur exécutif des partenariats avec l'industrie à Destination Canada. Before we dive into today's program, I wanted to mention that some of the research presented today is being uh, presented for the first time and will then be uploaded onto our website later on today, along with the recording of today's webinar. Les études que nous partagerons aujourd'hui sont des plus récentes. Dans certains cas, nous n'avons pas eu le temps de faire la traduction des diapositives en français. Sachez que nous publierons la présentation complète sur notre site Internet et ce dans les deux langues officielles. Un enregistrement sera également placé sur notre site Internet dans les prochains jours. Thanks so much, uh, Seb. Today marks our sixth COVID-19 webinar. We launched this series in March to make sure Canada's tourism industry knew what government programs and support was available to help them weather this devastating storm. As the crisis has evolved, so have government programs and Destination Canada's response and the resources we brought to your attention. This webinar series is for you uh, to meet your needs and help you navigate the road ahead. We know tourism businesses across the country are suffering more and more as the pandemic continues, and we want to be helpful. So we've taken your feedback uh, to inform today's agenda, which focuses uh, on research and marketing and how it's relevant to you. We're going to start with Destination Canada's uh, latest market research. The phased strategy, uh, recovery strategy we shared with you last month is based on facts uh, driven uh, by uh, the findings of our research team. In the wake of COVID-19, we widened our research program to inform our work and equip you with meaningful information to help you plan next steps in your business. After the research discussion, we'll give you an update on the domestic marketing program. Our research clearly indicates that the road to recovery starts close to home, beginning with what we call hyper-local travel, but basically that one to two hour drive from around communities, harnessing the pride of Canadians and the power of domestic travel uh, has never become more important. Minister Jolie, announced this weekend, Destination Canada is co-investing $30 million with provinces and territories on a domestic marketing campaign. This program is designed to kickstart local tourism marketing when conditions allow. This initiative will be rolled out starting as soon as possible. Provinces and territories at their own time will assess the best distribution of funds, taking into account local and regional circumstances health and safety, and importantly, the willingness of communities to welcome travelers back among many factors. Finally, we will conclude the webinar with tactical tips for leveraging Instagram as a marketing tool. These, tool, these tips will be the first in a series of quick practical ideas from the experts on our marketing team. So stay tuned for more great ideas you can use. Aujourd'hui marque déjà notre sixième webinaire suite à la COVID-19. Nous avons lancé cette série en mars pour nous assurer que l'industrie canadienne du tourisme soit au courant des programmes et du soutien gouvernemental disponibles pour aider à surmonter ces temps difficiles. Cette série de webinaires est pour vous et nous espérons répondre à vos besoins en partageant autant d'informations que possible pour vous aider à naviguer la tempête. Nous savons que les entreprises touristiques de tout le pays souffrent de plus en plus au fur et à mesure que la pandémie s'éternise. Nous sommes conscients du dommage que cette pandémie fait au sein de notre industrie. Le contenu d'aujourd'hui consiste d'études et d'analyses que Destination Canada a fait depuis la mi-mars, ainsi que notre plan marketing pour l'Intra-Canada. Nous espérons que ces informations vous seront utiles. Nos recherches indiquent clairement que le chemin de la reprise commence près de chez soi. 
en commençant par les voyages hyper locaux, de une heure à deux heures autour de chez soi. Il n'a jamais été aussi important de prendre avantage de la fierté des Canadiens envers leur pays et de s'assurer qu'ils voyagent au Canada cette année. Comme la ministre Jolie l'a annoncé durant la fin de semaine dernière, Destination Canada co-investira 30 millions avec les provinces et les territoires dans des campagnes régionales. Ce programme est conçu, à, est conçu pour aider à lancer la commercialisation du tourisme local lorsque les conditions le permettront. Cette initiative sera déployée le plus rapidement possible. Chaque province sera responsable d'évaluer la meilleure répartition des fonds et les dates de la campagne en tenant compte des circonstances locales et régionales suite à la COVID-19. Les infrastructures qui sont en place pour accueillir les visiteurs en toute sécurité et la volonté des communautés à accueillir les voyageurs. Enfin, nous terminons la présentation aujourd'hui par des trucs et conseils pratiques pour mieux bénéficier d'Instagram en tant qu'outil marketing. OK, thank you so much, uh, Seb. I'm now pleased to introduce uh, Chance Strong, Destination Canada's Executive Director of Research and Analytics. And Chance will then be followed by Destination Canada's Senior Vice President of Marketing Strategy and our Chief Marketing Officer, Gloria Laurie. Sans plus tarder, j'ai le plaisir de vous présenter Chance Strong, Directeur Exécutif des Recherches et Analytiques à Destination Canada. Chance sera suivi par Gloria Laurie, notre vice-présidente principale stratégie et chef du marketing à Destination Canada. Thank you, Sébastien. Thank you, Dave. Um, so I'll be uh, taking over the presentation from here. Um, a, uh, I think uh, we, we had in the agenda uh, time for questions. I believe the intent is, is if you have questions, please enter them in the chat uh, and we'll do our best to answer them time permitting. Uh, and get back to you. Um, la présentation sera en anglais, uh, mais si vous avez des questions en français, n'hésitez pas de uh, l'inscrire dans le, dans le chat et on, on va vous répondre um, uh, dès que possible. Um, so thank you uh, for joining us on this uh, on this presentation. Um, what we wanted to do is provide an overview uh, to industry on the various pieces uh, of information that we're gathering around um, the impacts of COVID on the tourism industry. Um, uh, some of the ways that we feel uh, based on the data available that we can um, uh, accelerate a, a recovery path. Uh, and then also some of the information that's being gathered as the industry um, grapples with how to deal with a new reality um, as things open up again. Um, I do want to stress that some of the messages and information in here may be things that you're familiar with, uh, uh, but our intent is to provide this information because we always need to keep validating this with, uh, with our industry uh, just to make sure that we're not missing something important. Um, And um, we also feel that a lot of this information will help us understand um, the impacts of COVID so that we can assess how quickly uh, tourism is recovering, uh, how fast, uh, where there are pockets where, where maybe recovery isn't happening as quickly so that uh, we can take action on the marketing side and that we can communicate this to various partners uh, within the federal government and elsewhere to uh, help accelerate our eventual recovery. There we go. Uh, so uh, the key points that uh, we'd like to stress, and uh, this is all based on data and information, which I'll be walking through, is um, looking forward to recovery. Um, thinking local will be key. Uh, we're going to walk through uh, what we see as local and uh, the potential that's out there uh, for tourism businesses. The other point that uh, we'd like to stress is that the, communi the community in which you operate is more important than ever. And then finally, We want to stress that uh, we're all in this together as an industry, probably in ways um, um, that we haven't been before. Uh, and so we will walk through some of some of the efforts we're making on the marketing side uh, for a community-based program. So 
So one of the challenges we have with COVID is um, there are so many different sources of information which are um, coming at us from all these different um, uh, points of view. Uh, so many of them are conflicting. Uh, many of them aren't relevant, to be honest, to the Canadian context. Uh, and so we found in the first few days after COVID um, that we were um, bombarded with information. And so what we wanted to do was identify the information that's relevant to Canadian industry uh, and provide that out to our industry partners as quickly as we can. Um, and so we'll be walking through some of these findings. So the uh, first piece that we're gonna walk through is obviously COVID-19 has hit us hard. Uh, and it, no part of the industry has been, uh, has been not, not affected by this. Unlike other, um, you know, say the financial impact of 2008, 2009, where it was just on one part, COVID-19 in particular has had effect on travelers, on the demand of travelers. It's had an effect on our communities. Um, and then it's also had an effect on, on industry itself. Uh, and so we've been working with a number of different um, uh, experts to understand what is that actual impact. What we have um, determined and we've um, communicated this out is that um, COVID will have an impact on, um, on the economy at large. Uh, we're looking at two different scenarios. One where the scenario is um, contained uh, and that we have a summer season so travel is, is possible. Uh, in July and August, and the other is where travel may be restricted in some ways through July and August and we lose those core months where um, the industry's profits are, are mainly made. No matter what the scenario is, there will be an impact on the economy at large, and particularly concerning is that we anticipate that there'll be uh, approximately twice as much of an impact on tourism in particular. Um, uh, and so this is particularly concerning. Um, in that we, this, this sector will bear the brunt of the uh, economic impact. We anticipate it could take between two to five years to return to pre-COVID levels. Um, and this has had impacts, as I've said, across all parts of the industry. We are actively tracking this. Um, obviously, it's had a profound impact on hotel occupancy. Um, as of April 2020, we estimated that uh, this is around $840 million lost to the hotel sector alone. Um, uh, there's also been a collapse in overnight arrivals um, uh, across, across, across the country as the borders have closed. Uh, and that's been true also at the land border. Um, there has been some crossing at the border, but that's primarily for, for shipments. But in terms of actual arrivals that uh, drive tourism is really flatlined. Um, and these, these impacts are being uh, felt across the country. Um, and across different segments. Um, so we are tracking this at a provincial level. Uh, at a regional level, at a city level, uh, and the you know the impacts are particularly acute in those areas where um, where tourism was to be um, higher. So the you know the core of Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, Banff, Niagara, and Quebec City are the ones where the impacts are are are, are being felt the the most uh, in terms of uh, lowered occupancy and lower visitation. Uh, it's also had a devastating impact on on business events. Uh, the graph here shows um, what was planned. So that is the uh, outline in blue. Um, the uh, uh, the um, two January and February are the events that did happen. In black are the ones that uh, are still in the books, but we know have been canceled. So March, April, and May have essentially had zero business events. And we also know that the events still in the books in June, July, and August are, for all intents and purposes, also canceled. There are business events that are still being on the books for September, October, and November, but again, these are, are seriously at risk. So we are looking at uh, a very um, large impact on the business event sector. Uh, and so what we're doing is we're taking all this and we're providing uh, in our research kind of the estimated impacts on an ongoing basis in terms of lost revenue uh, across the country. Uh, this is being fed in, as I said, into policy discussions and is available for the use of anyone in the industry um, on, on, our, on our website, destinationcanada.com, uh, and we have been providing this information on an ongoing basis. Um, and the core part to coronavirus um, in particular is there is so much uncertainty about what's going to happen uh, and how, how to deal with it. Um, 
there's even a way to measure uncertainty. Uh, and compared to any other pandemic, uh, this uh, beats that by several factors. Um, and so in times of uncertainty, the core thing to do is focus on what we do know. Um, and so what we do know, and, and I'll be walking through the data that supports this, is that domestic, the domestic market will drive our recovery. We also know that our community is more important than ever. Uh, and that um, the only way that we're going to get through this quickly, as quickly as we possibly can, is if we work together. So um, there's no doubt that uh, international markets are reeling. Um, there are still some travel on the books, uh, and I'll walk through that a little bit. But overall, what we're seeing is that international travel is, um, uh, is, is losing revenue at a pace that um, we had not anticipated uh, when we first did our modeling in April. Uh, this graph shows uh, a scenario in, um, I guess that color is teal, which is that uh, scenario where uh, travel was possible in July and August. Um, and then the uh, kind of worst case scenario, which is in red line, the red line where, where travel was not possible. Uh, the dark blue line shows the impacts in terms of revenue. Uh, this is from the US, but the line is very similar across all of our international markets, uh, where we're actually seeing because of the incredibly low occupancy uh, across the hotel sector, we're actually seeing um, very, very low um, travel overall. Um, and it's, it's, it's pervasive across many. So our international markets are reeling. Uh, and we know that different countries are having different um, uh, abilities to respond, and we are taking that into consideration. Uh, so what you have here is the number of uh, new cases um, since uh, the first 100th case was reported. You see Canada as a red line, uh, Germany and the US, and these are just examples, but we are paying attention to every market and trying to understand what that means. Uh, we're also paying attention to what uh, is going on within our markets uh, and trying to understand that, um, and trying to understand uh, what people are saying around um, their intent to travel outside of their, their piece. Uh, we are keeping this up to date and we anticipate that the likelihood to travel outside their country will change as this evolves, but at the moment it's very high. So moving forward, what we do see, however, is we do see that uh, some group bookings are still being held on to. Um, we anticipate that as the travel date gets closer, um, that um, uh, many of these may, may move off the books as, as people rebook their, their travel. Um, and so based on all of this information, what we've done is we've worked with a number of uh, different organizations uh, in the media sphere, in the technology sphere, and obviously in the travel sphere to understand how travel will restart. Uh, this has been informed with conversations um, uh, with the epidemiologists and how um, they see government restrictions lifting. And so what we have is a phased approach to it. The first phase is what we're terming COVID response. In this, re in this phase, no travel is possible um, by any means. Slowly, uh, what we'll see is a hyper-local phase. This is where uh, travel restrictions are being lifted. Um, people feel comfortable about driving one to two hours away. Um, they may start taking day trips, but they will be traveling within their bubble. So generally within the close family that they've been uh, under COVID restrictions with. Um, and at this point, this is when um, hotel attra uh, outdoor attractions such as golf courses, parks within cities and within communities will be open. Uh, the next phase then will be that um, regional travel will be uh, possible and desired. So this will be travel within a province. Uh, generally, this will be drive travel. This is when we'll start seeing the beginning of overnight trips. Um, and then maybe people going a, a half day to, um, you know, a little bit longer outside their community. Um, people may be traveling uh, within their bubble and maybe one other bubble. Um, at this point, we would start seeing smaller leisure attractions being um, uh, being able to be open, etc. Um, after that, the phase after that, that's when we'll start seeing uh, pro uh, travel across provincial boundaries. Um, at this point, we anticipate uh, leisure travel will re-begin, um, generally for shorter flights. Um, we will start seeing overnight trips, multi-day trips. And at this point, we may start seeing, uh, you know, extended family, friends, and small groups of coworkers, so multiple bubbles traveling together. Um, eventually, the, uh, the borders will reopen. We anticipate the very first piece that will uh, revive for us will be the U.S. drive market. Um, travelers will be willing to take longer, uh, longer road trips primarily, 
uh, and we'll start seeing more and more uh, attractions open. Finally, the new normal will happen, and this is where uh, we anticipate all the international travel that uh, will be happening will happen, long haul flights will happen, uh, and this is when we would see things get back to regularized international. We're not saying it's going back to normal, this could be the new normal, and I'll have a little bit of a discussion of what that could look like at the end of my presentation. So we took all of this framework that we developed with our partners and we developed a, a recovery analysis framework that we're using and applying um, to every province in Canada, uh, to key states in the United States and to all of our international markets. You can find this information on destinationcanada.com. Um, but essentially what we're doing is we're trying to assess where are the travelers at in terms of their appetite to travel and their intent to travel uh, and where are they at on that phase? So we have hyperlocal uh, travel, we have regional travel, et cetera. Um, and so you can find this on our website. Um, and so I'll just walk through what, what this looks like shortly. So there's the same uh, present uh, slide in French. Uh, for uh, no colleague Francais. Um, so what we are doing is we're taking all this data, uh, we're analyzing over 715 signals, we're using artificial intelligence to support this analysis so we don't miss any important signals. Um, and the result of it is um, documents that look like this. So this is a summary, uh, again, that you can find online of our international markets. We assess that as of right now, China, Germany, and South Korea are all onto domestic travel. Domestic travel is happening, is happening within that country. And so this is actually from a traveler perspective. So maybe in other countries that the restrictions are lifted, but they're not quite ready to travel. So we're actually looking at things like accommodation searches, accommodation booking, air booking, air searches, and uh, Google travel uh, intent lift uh, to understand where we're at in terms of these different um, pieces. We also assess that the US is uh, allowing um, interstate uh, travel, but it's very, very um, different from state to state to state um, in terms of how different states are approaching COVID and how the residents are, are reacting to that. Um, so all of this to say, we do know that international travel will be very uncertain moving forward. Um, overall, based on our analysis, domestic travel in some countries has restarted, but really international travel is essentially at a standstill. Um, so what we've done is we've, we've, we've scoped out the size of our domestic market. Um, and so just to provide context for everyone on the call, um, the within province uh, travel market varies by province, um, but it's worth about $19.7 billion. In general, uh, and this is all based on pre-COVID times, so we still don't know what travel will look like post, um, post restriction but we're basing a lot of our assumptions based on what things looked like beforehand. We will be doing studies uh, and um, ongoing research to understand how that looks post COVID and we will be sharing that with industry. Uh, however, intra-provincial uh, travel, on average uh, is about 2.2 nights per visit. So we're looking at weekend trips um, and the, the most lucrative um, segment was actually two adults, no children. Um, so something to keep in mind as you think about travel within a province. Um, the size of the provincial market within province market generally followed um, the, uh, the population size. The next piece that we looked at was travel between provinces. Um, and so in this case, if you are looking to bring uh, travelers from another province, plan for long weekend trips. These trips will generally not be very long, three, three to four days. Um, the spend per night will be relatively high. Um, and again, proximity matters. So really it's around key uh, corridors of travel, um, and it makes sense. If, if you look at how travel will restart, it'll be drive first. So uh, uh, the Alberta BC corridor will be a key one. Ontario Quebec will be a key one. Um, Ontario to the Maritimes will be the third. And again, we've scoped out the size of these different travel markets um, with uh, Alberta actually coming in second. Uh, there's a lot of travel from Alberta to BC. Um, and then finally, the other piece that we've been looking at And we thought we'd show you Dave and Sebastian one more time. So handsome. 
Um, there is a $36.381 billion travel market that has not yet been tapped in the domestic market. And this is the fact that Canada is the eighth largest international travel market in the world. We travel a lot. In fact, we've done some analysis. Canadians spend a dollar and 70 cents on travel abroad for every dollar that international visitors spend here. Said another way, if we capture about 60% of what Canadians spent abroad, we will have made up the loss of the international travel. So our job is to convince these Canadians to travel within Canada. Um, and what's interesting is the outbound travel market is significant across all of Canada. Uh, for example, in Manitoba alone, it's uh, just about a billion, just over a billion dollars. And, um, you know, unlike potentially the, um, the concept of domestic travel, the travel that Canadians are used to taking abroad is actually on par with any international traveler. We're not cheap when we travel abroad. We generally take uh, trips of about a week long. Uh, our spend per night is actually very high. Uh, and so this is a potential lucrative market. I mean, obviously there's gonna be some impacts if there is a recession uh, and some economic downturns associated with COVID. But at the same time, please keep in mind that this is a travel segment that is used to traveling regularly for long trips and spending a fair amount when they travel. And this segment actually gives us a lot of benefits as we look to rebuild and make a more resilient travel uh, uh, visitor economy. Uh, one piece is, is that we know based on data is that 29% um, of Canadians traveled in Canada because it was a place that they had visited before and they wanted to return. So if we can take advantage of this next period of time to get more Canadians to explore more of their country, we believe that that can actually uh, create a, uh, a reinforcing loop where more Canadians will actually choose to travel in Canada as opposed to traveling abroad. The other piece is, is that um, a personal recommendation is the number one source of influence. All of these Canadians have connections externally. So the power of this would be if they can say, yes, I've been to this part of Canada and it was amazing, and that's the sort of experience they will have when they travel, uh, that can actually help the international market rebound that much faster. Um, we have done an assessment of domestic travel within Canada. On the whole, at the moment, as of May 24th, and I realize in COVID years, that's about a decade ago, uh, we will be updating this in a few days. Uh, but at this point, we've assessed that um, all, all, all provinces and territories are at the hyperlocal phase, except for Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, and the Northwest Territories. Um, those, those parts, based on the data that we're seeing uh, on accommodation search, on Google search, and a few other pieces, is saying that they're still not quite ready to be in that phase where hyperlocal travel is happening, where people are willing to get in a car and travel one to two hours outside their, their residence. Uh, we've noted that Nunavut is actually at a regional travel piece. That's primarily because of the size um, of it, but um, that's basically the equivalent to hyperlocal. So they're beginning to travel within Nunavut, but not leaving Nunavut yet. Um, and so based on all of this, we, we want to stress that while tourism is the same business, it is not business as usual. Um, and we've been looking very closely at the experience in other countries. So you'll see headlines such as Shanghai Disneyland reopening tickets sell out in minutes. True, but um, Shanghai Disneyland was at one third capacity. Um, the other part is, is that in some places like Venice, they're reopening but without many tourists. So we're really seeing sort of a dichotomy in terms of domestic rebound happening very quickly in some places and then in other places them staying away. So this is something we're tracking very closely um, and we're, we're really trying to understand domestically, will it be a, a quick rebound um, with a lot of pent up demand or will be people be more reticent? Uh, we believe that it'll probably be on a province by province basis. The other piece to keep in mind is health and safety is here to stay. Um, but our challenge is, is how do you make this a fun part of the experience? So what you have here is a, a picture live uh, with um, visitors in Shanghai Disneyland trying to take a picture of Jack Sparrow. And they actually have designated places where they can take a picture. Uh, this is great from a health and safety perspective, but maybe could also be you get an unobstructed view of, of your hero there. Um, and so that you can, you can really take advantage of, 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 of maybe having less crowds. 
So how we can make these health and safety pieces a part of our experience is going to be one of the ways that we can get uh, domestic travel to uh, rebound quickly. The other piece that is maybe slightly different now is that our communities are critical for tourism. Um, we've been doing uh, a fair amount of research and understanding what is the welcome of, vis of communities to visitors. Um, and so you can find this up on our web. It's updated uh, every week. Um, in fact, uh, about five minutes prior to this presentation, I got uh, next week's piece. Uh, that'll be updated on our website uh, tomorrow. Um, and basically the core message that is telling us right now is at the moment, uh, residents of communities are not yet um, they're, they're relatively open to welcoming uh, visitors from communities near them uh, and then potentially from other parts of their province. But we're really not seeing that, um, that openness yet to welcoming people from other parts of Canada and certainly not internationally. Um, and so this is something we're going to be tracking on an ongoing basis to make sure that the communities that we'll be bringing visitors into are ready and willing to accept visitors uh, and um, and all that. Um, the, the key part to this though is that the community and their understanding of all of the amazing things that tourism actually brings to a community are well understood. Um, there's the business part, absolutely, but tourism actually brings social, cultural, and environmental um, impacts in a positive manner to the communities they work that they operate in. Um, you take any place that uh, welcomes tourists and it's actually a really great place to live. And I think um, what we're seeing based on the information is that this will be more and more important as we move forward is all of us taking on that role where we highlight that um, tourism is important to the livability of cities, to the social, cultural, environmental and economic impacts uh, and benefits within a community. The last question obviously that we have to answer is can they actually travel? Uh, we are tracking um, the various ongoing web of, um, of restrictions uh, on travel. Uh, this is a simplified graph. We do have a document that's uh, up online. Uh, and again, this is as of May 26. So some jurisdictions are requiring self-isolation of incoming domestic travelers. So those are uh, noted in red. Um, and I think um, this just changed uh, yesterday. Um, other jurisdictions have, you know, restrictions on indoor attractions. On the whole, in terms of accommodation, most have that uh, available and open as long as they meet the health and safety requirements. Um, for more information, you can find all of this information in a single document. Uh, it's called the Impact and Recovery Report, Resident Sentiment and Travel-Related Measures. Um, and again, we are doing our best to um, make sure that we track all of the uh, tourism related measures that are important within the different provinces and on an ongoing basis. Um, and then finally, how will they travel? So we've been paying a lot of attention to uh, various studies um, that try to understand what, how will people travel moving forward. Um, we've compiled this into a few slides to provide some information and some thoughts. Um, um, just to make the slides not very busy, we haven't sourced all of them, but um, if, if, if there is any interest, we can, we can track down where, where all these points come from. So what we've heard kind of on aggregate, what travelers want is they want flexibility. Um, maybe this is on cancellation policies, this is on reservations. They want safe environments. They want to feel that uh, things will be safe. Um, therefore, um, you need to provide some information on how to experience what the safety and cleaning protocols are, as well as the booking and, and cancellation procedures. The more you can have visible cleaning uh, protocols, the better. Um, so it, it probably won't be enough to just say, trust us, uh, maybe have a little, um, you know, a little, a little piece um, where you actually show, here's what we do on an ongoing basis. Uh, and then give some thought to minimal touch and social distance experiences. So the example that we provided, it's a simple one, but how can you have people take um, experience, get, get the experience they want, but in a way where you have uh, social, uh, socially distant. Um, so some ideas of what travel could look like moving forward, uh, pre-registration uh, schemes, advanced ticketing, um, reduced ca uh, capacities, obviously. Uh, it may be that um, there'll be a request to provide uh, disposable personal protection. Um, and then maybe give some thought to, you know, what does the PPA look like for your staff? Um, is it going to be uniform across all of them? 
Uh, I believe some organizations are even thinking of putting branding on it. Um, social distancing uh, observed through uh, special visual markers, hand sanitizer everywhere, uh, digital menus. So, you know, do you hold your menu, et cetera? Digital visitor maps and guides. And then to the extent possible, how can you do self-guided or self-driven tours? So that's what things could look like. Again, um, everyone's trying to figure this out. And this is a compilation of what we're seeing out there in terms of um, what things could look like. Uh, finally, what you can do now, um, plan for various realities, look to booking ahead, uh, PPE for guests and staff, uh, preparing your communications. Um, your FAQ section will probably get a lot longer. Um, and then think about uh, maybe online bookings to manage uh, demand. Um, so those are some pieces that we're seeing out there in terms of uh, how things could look um, post-COVID. Um, and again, we've, we've, we've posted uh, a lot of these, all of these tools that I've talked through up online uh, and you can access them. And so if hyperlocal is where recovery starts, uh, community is key. The other part that is uh, critically important is, um, uh, is working uh, together. Uh, I'll now pa pass it over to Gloria Lurie, uh, who will speak through um, that aspect of, of the work we're doing to support tourism. Thank you, Chance. Um, and I, I wanted to provide, before I get into this, is a, a, a little bit of a, a follow-up short piece in terms of the, what we're doing right now for a marketing program. Before I do, though, I want to say we know, you know, we're presenting a lot of information today on research about what's happening right now, where demand might be this summer, where opportunity might be this summer. And, and we're well aware that there's a number of you on the call that um, have already had to make the extraordinarily um, difficult decision to not reopen this summer and that you're looking farther ahead. And I just want to reassure you that so are we. There's so much work that uh, the research team is doing that we're going to compartmentalize it and put it into um, various segments as, as we have that information available. And so, for example, we are continuing to do the Global Tourism Watch, which is going to be extraordinarily helpful for us to look a little farther ahead and see what has changed within all of our markets. And we'll be following up in future sessions with what we're seeing. And I also want to say that what we're doing is really increasing the frequency of the signals that we're looking at so that we can signal or, or we can anticipate when we're seeing changes sooner and faster. And, trying to pay attention to any of the data that we can get in a timely way versus really lag data and marry the insights from something like a huge omnibus work like Global Tourism Watch to very timely research that we'll be seeing in the future. So um, you'll be seeing lots of chance and he's going to have to um, be as amazing as he was today in handling those technical issues. You could see that he was getting challenged there and being able to run the slides and I thought I thought he did a fantastic job. Uh, hopefully, um, since I'm not driving, I'll just work with whoever does have um, control there and let you know um, when to advance. And I'll give everybody um, a short insight into how we're working together to address the challenges that we have in terms of a marketing and communications challenge. So right now, what we've had to do is, given all those complexities that Chance outlined, figure out something that makes sense to be um, respectful to resident sentiment to adhere to and um, reflect all the health guidelines and to know that when we come out with a marketing program it has to be flexible enough to perhaps be shifted or quieted down again if we're seeing surges or changes to community sentiment so quite quite a different landscape and the other thing is if you advance the slide where it's led our our understanding is that with our plan in the domestic program in particular if communities are really going to um, be the um, sentiment that we're looking at then communities have to lead a return to the communications they have to be the network that helps travelers understand um, what's safe to do and what what they can do Canadians, Chance pointed out, are really good at spending their money abroad. And so we have to help let people know what they can do in their own backyards and in their own country. And so 
at Destination Canada, our role has, is one of where we have to lead from behind, if you will, where we have to cheer the country on and make sure that there is a centralized theme, but one where we're letting the community voice and timing really direct the way that the messaging is executed. So if you advance that slide, um, we really are standing up and trying to understand what are the what is the value here in terms of working with our communities. And it's not just about what are the economic benefits of tourism, but what is the intersection? What are all the benefits in terms of social, cultural, and economic benefits of the visitor economy? And so if you advance that slide one more time for me, um, it, it gives us a lot of um, power to the fact that we have a, a brand that speaks to these very values and is fully aligned with the way of glowing hearts being able to be leverage pride in community and pride in terms of seeing what the makers and creators are doing and how there is resilience across the country and not just within tourism but within our communities. So if you advance the slide one more time. So that theme, we've talked a lot about a centralized theme and what we know about Canadians is we've all been called nice before. We've never necessarily embraced it, certainly not as a call to action or something that's really going to drive immediate demand. But it, at the end of the day, it's true. People think of Canadians as nice. We see that all the time, particularly in other markets. Um, and you know what? The time right now, I think, Sometimes we see a real paucity of nice in the world, but not in Canada, not as, um, in terms of the examples we see. And so we'd actually like the communities themselves to speak to this idea and what kind of spirit their communities have around this thing that Canadians are known for. And so if you advance the slide, we're asking therefore Canadians to just celebrate not just the place, but the people and, and how that really um, gives a certain brand to their local community and what kind of values they highlight when they see an intersection between farmers and restaurateurs and we're already seeing that in terms of how restaurants have been able to help continue with um, supply chain from farmers by selling extra produce in selling their um, takeaway meals. So if you advance that slide and if it is starting uh, local that would be in response to perhaps you heard about our announcement over the weekend in terms, and Dave referred to it off the top as well, our partnership with provinces, territories. We also have a partnership with the Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada. Uh, work, and we work with our other partners at Parks Canada and um, the airlines to be able to make sure that funds are getting to where they can matter most. And in working with provinces and territories, it's making sure it's getting out in the communities so that they, we still have that entire entire workforce and network across the country of experts who knows who know very well what is going on in their backyard. So you advance the slide. Uh, we see nice every day. We see examples of it, and it's um, can be folks singing to each other and posting hearts on their windows. It is also about community place and how people are having their human response to the geography that they're in and posting it with pride. So if you advance one more, we're also trying to, in being um, respectful of how communities speak, it's also clear to us that everybody has a different uh, way in and creativity. And so the um, call is to be, is broad, whether you want to post stories in social, have a podcast, make a jingle, art projects outside. It's our job to amplify what is um, happening within the communities. And um, we're excited to see what um, gets produced. If you advance the slide once more, I think the most important thing is for us to really own it with some swagger and to appreciate that, you know, nice may at first seem vanilla or even perhaps boring, but it it's anything but. And you know Canadians prove that over and over, and um, it it is. I, I always uh, think of it as having like owning it with a real kind of push and also almost like subverting the idea. So if you advance one more time, the other thing around us wanting to talk about nice instead of maybe leveraging ideas around explore is we want something that really does endure, and we need it to. Um, not be something that turns off. Nice can be, in fact, 
that a community needs to remain closed to protect um, the health of their citizens. And so there's this idea that it is a sentiment rather than a command on what to be doing. And um, we're in this for the long game and this is our way of being able to look nice as well as authentic. If you advance again, we'll, um, we really do. And this kind of speaks to the way of uh, that little bit of swagger. And over time, we will show this perfection of, uh, of the Canadian nice. Um, that's really, it's a, a light introduction, but that's where we are. Um, traditionally, old days, pre-COVID, I'd maybe show you a video and our new web platform and our, um, all of our uh, prepared media. We don't have that right now. What I truly want to emphasize is that we are letting the communities lead this restart and it's our job to amplify those voices and stories and give them the attention they deserve. So, and thank you for your quick uh, attention today. And I will pass it over to Emily to uh, highlight perhaps some of the things, little tips and tricks you could be doing uh, in Instagram. Thank you. So um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Chance and uh, Gloria for that. And, and I hope, um, uh, just to underscore maybe again, uh, what both of them have said that, you know, we're basing uh, marketing direction decisions based on the work of Chance's team and trying to, you know, create a campaign that responds to, you know, the strange environment we're in where some provinces will open before others, where we're able to provide assistance as quickly as possible, where there is an opening so that we can take advantage of the, the summer months and creating content that will eventually ladder up and that we'll be able to make use of internationally when the time is right too. So all part of the thinking uh, on Gloria's team. So thank you both for that. Uh, I am gonna introduce uh, Emily Ross. Uh, we've heard from many of you that uh, you're taking time right now to sharpen some of your uh, marketing skills in your own businesses. Um, you identified social media as a particular area of interest uh, of knowing more. So we've created a quick tutorial on one of the strongest platforms uh, inspiring travel these days. So here are some quick tips and advice on how to leverage Instagram. And this is Destination Canada's Senior Manager of Global Content, Emily Ross. Merci Chance et Gloria, les présentations étaient super claires. Uh, beaucoup d'entre vous nous ont dit que vous preniez ce temps pour exercer vos compétences en marketing. Et plusieurs ont dit que les médias sociaux étaient un créneau d'intérêt. Nous avons donc demandé à notre gestionnaire principal du marketing de contenu, Emily Ross, de partager avec vous quelques trucs pour maximiser vos résultats via Instagram. Emily? Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to speak with you today. As mentioned, I'm Emily Ross, and I'm the Senior Manager of Global Content at Destination Canada. And what that means exactly is I have the opportunity to help tell those stories Gloria was talking about across different platforms each day, including social media. As it was alluded to, um, one of the channels that's been particularly integral in the success of reaching our communities is Instagram. So it was once thought of as kind of a fun social platform for curating images, but it's become much more than that. And it's being leveraged as a powerful tool for brands and businesses across the world. This is likely due to the fact that it's pretty easy to use, it's very affordable, and it has a massive impact. So I'm going to walk through a, quick, a few quick tips as promised um, that help us grow our account and increase engagement that we think might be useful for your businesses as well. So in a world of endless social options, it can be actually quite hard to choose what tool to use, especially when you have limited time and resources. Instagram, however, is pretty powerful mostly due to its massive reach and its consistent growth in Canada month over month. Another thing Instagram has done is in introduced new functionality that has made it more than a personal tool, as I mentioned, but one that can help businesses share relevant information. So if there are updates on how they're approaching social distance activities or things like that. And then eventually when the time is right, it can also be a tool that can help convert customers. And what's Another benefit to our industry is that travel is actually one of the most popular topics. Actually, it is number one with music and food being number two and number three. So people are using it to look for travel, but they're also using it to plan for travel. 
they're using Instagram to look for new inspiration, new places to visit, and also new services. But in a slew of beautiful places and amazing pictures, amazing experiences, how do you stand out? I have three quick slides that will hopefully give you some insight on how to make your Instagram content work a little bit harder for you. So, oops, spoiler. Um, so of course, visuals are key, but what we've found is that certain um, themes perform best and can give your account a more cohesive look without being overtly branded. So the themes that work for us might not work for you, but they could be a good place to start and play around with. So essentially you have to do a little bit of trial and error to see what works for your business and what your audience responds to. But the best part about this is that you probably already have some of the content that will resonate already on hand. And if you don't, you probably have a smartphone and that's really the only tool that you need. People don't expect or necessarily like super polished content. They want to see things that they can imagine themselves in or maybe even things that they could create themselves. So we really do like the images to speak for themselves as well and refrain from using too much branding. Our community wants to be inspired by your images, by your story, by your business, not by a logo. And instead you'll find natural ways to bring your brand to life. Um, oops. This will come in the form potentially of captions. This is your kind of platform to tell a story. And we found that our audience craves this information from us. It was previously thought that a snappy, snippy caption with lots of emoji, emojis would be attention grabbing, but we actually find that adding more detail is what people want. And it also gives us the opportunity to tell them a little bit more. We want to give them information in the caption so they don't have to look elsewhere. And this means your business can become a source that they look to, to learn more. Specific details also keep people really engaged. So think of things like quotes or testimonials that you may already be gathering or even first person stories or interviews with people on your staff or people who've come to visit in the past. These help add authenticity and educate people about what your business might be like to experience. And once you've built up your community and see a little bit more interaction there, you can actually start interacting with them too. And this will just help build the buzz and excitement around your business and help them get to know you better as well. This can be as simple as asking at the end of a caption for a user to tag who they'd like to come and experience something with. Another important element to use is hashtags so that people can find your content and amplify it as well, as Gloria mentioned. You can use ones from your province, your city, your region. You can use our Explore Canada hashtags, so Canada Nice or For Glowing Hearts, or others that might be relevant to your specific business. There isn't a one-size-fits-all hashtag guide, but there are some that you can probably easily think of that are related to your work. And lastly, oops, too far, too far. <laughs> um, don't be afraid to try something new. Through trial and error, we've found lots of different things work and don't. And one of those main things that you might have to play around with a little bit is when's the best time to post for your audience? For us, it's in the mornings, Eastern time. So we try to put our content there so we can reach people when they're most engaged. But that said, no matter what works for your business, consistency is really key on Instagram. And one of the easiest ways to remain consistent is to use a scheduling tool so that you can do a lot of work at once. Instead of having to go in and do work every single day, you can batch content, create it, and post it all at once as kind of a set and forget play. Um, and the final point that we can end on is that you should look to try different types of content once you've gotten a bit of a groove. Um, you can look at Instagram stories so you can share more information maybe on your website when people can swipe up to your account or video posts too if that's accessible. But most importantly is focus on creating content that is for your audience. Don't create ads, don't create what might look the flashiest. Consider your audience and what they want to see because that's what they want from businesses and brands as well. So that was a really quick run through, but hopefully it's shown that Instagram doesn't have to be super time intensive and you don't have to be an expert. If you have an iPhone or some photos and some information about your business, which I'm sure you have lots of great stories, um, you'll be able to take a look at that and hopefully get started in a way that's really meaningful for you. And now back over to Dave. Thank you very much, uh, Emily. And thanks to the rest of the DC team too. We've now reached the end of today's program. So thank you for your time. 
Uh, a recording of this webinar as well as slides in English and French will be available on our website soon. I'm going to invite you to our next webinar, uh, which we're holding on June 11th, uh, which will be exclusively on the subject of business events. So please come back and join us then. Also, please sign up for our newsletter and check the COVID-19 section of our website often. Uh, as you heard from Chance, we're updating it on a daily basis, so you'll want to make sure that you've got the most up-to-date information for you. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity today to ask you to keep in touch with our Team Canada partners, the local tourism authorities, uh, including destination and provincial marketing associations right across the country, and of course, the Tourism Industry Association of Canada. It's by working together that we'll come through this stronger and more resilient than ever before. Voici ce qui nous amène à la fin du webinaire d'aujourd'hui. Uh, merci beaucoup à tous pour votre temps. Merci Gloria, Chen, Emily pour ces superbes présentations. Permettez-moi de répéter qu'un un enregistrement de ce webinaire ainsi que les diapos en anglais et en français seront disponibles sur notre site internet sous peu. Notre prochain webinaire sera le 11 juin et le focus sera sur les événements d'affaires. Le contenu consistera de résultats d'études faits par Destination Canada sur les voyageurs d'affaires ainsi qu'une discussion avec des panélistes de l'industrie. Veuillez vous inscrire à notre bulletin d'information et consulter régulièrement la section COVID-19 de notre site Internet pour obtenir les informations les plus récentes. J'aimerais également profiter de cette occasion pour vous encourager à rester en, cont en contact avec vos autorités touristiques locales y compris les associations de marketing des destinations et des provinces, et bien sûr, l'Association de l'industrie touristique du Canada. À bientôt. Bonne fin de journée.